Tani. That couldn't make. We're actually there. there. I'd like to call the meeting to order. <laughs> it's a new Boston town. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd like to call the, the school board meeting to order. Um, You're gaveling fourth grade. Um, give him the gavel, I have a gavel. He, <laughs> he can throw it too. So uh, before we move uh, forward with the formal agenda, I would just like to take a minute to um, to say thank you to uh, Dr. Montesano and the rest of the administration, and frankly the the rest of the um, the community for the bond uh, referendum results. But specifically. Um, Specifically, Dr. Montesano and, 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 and Dan and the rest of the team, I think, did a very good job of uh, putting together the project and trying to involve as many uh, of the community uh, members as possible and reaching out to different constituencies and having forums and tours and answering questions and, and going through it all. So um, that's a lot of work, uh, but the hard work has just begun. So true. Thank, very you. True. thank you for thank all you. that. Thank you. Um, so I think that the first uh, item on the agenda is to, in fact, approve the official results, which I think have, have um, uh, changed a little bit from the, the, the original count just because of the, um, the affidavit results that have come in since we first reported. So, Connie, do you have that? It seems to have gone up the margin. Yeah, the, there, were 20, there were 21... Uh, 21 affidavit ballots. So I think the the percentage of yays was about 84 percent, close to 85 percent, which is fantastic, and happy about the turnout. Yes. So, um, can I get a motion to um, approve the official results of the capital improvement project bond referendum? Move. Any second? Second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. There are two sets of minutes. Um, from the uh, from the last full board meeting and then the special meeting. So, um, does anybody have any uh, comments on the minutes for for Connie or any corrections or alterations? Great. Can you, can you just double check? I think I was listed as being there and not being there on one of one of them. That if you would just double, yeah, I was not there. Um. So a motion to um, approve both sets of minutes from the last meetings. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So um, we've had a request to, to change the order of the agenda to have our students present next, which I think is fine. So at this point, I'd like to invite, um, I guess, uh, Ms. Murray up to, to introduce them. I think we're going to introduce uh, Mara and okay. Trisha Murray. Okay, great. Um, as you know, one of the dispositions of the proms is on innovation, and I think they're going to talk to us a little bit about that. And we have some very excited youngsters here who are going to take over the show in a little while. And I appreciate you moving the agenda up because I know yeah. they have homework to get to and all those kind of fun things. Okay, good evening. Um, the work presented by our elementary school teachers and students this evening connects to our high school and middle school students who presented earlier this year to the Board of Education um, and focuses on our district-wide commitment to innovation. You may recall we heard from students developing probes to conduct sensitive tests for pollution in the Bronx River, and students creating apps to address the needs of identi as identified through local businesses, as well as students learning math by, th by and through the creation of art. The curriculum you will hear about this evening is based on the indicators and outcomes developed by our K-12 teaching faculty as it relates to innovation. Through teacher-created curriculum based on these indicators and outcomes, students have the opportunity to empathize and ask questions in order to understand, brainstorm, imagine, and incubate ideas, plan, design, and create prototypes, apply the design through testing, and reflect and revise as needed. All of these skills build their capacity to innovate, discover and create, and to make something new from what you know. This work exemplifies our K-12 commitment to the disposition of innovation and connects the experiences of our youngest innovators to those that our middle and high school students will explore, which increase in complexity, content understanding, and skill. 
So tonight you'll be hearing from Carol Ann Del Judas, our elementary instructional technology teacher, and Claire Holaku, one of our third grade teachers. Together they've been teaching a pilot uh, project uh, with Claire's students, both during their coding sessions and during their regular uh, classroom sessions. And um, this project is what just what Mara really described. It, it offers them this opportunity to design, um, empathize, and kind of start the planning process, which is where they are right now. Uh, so Carol Ann and Claire can come on up. They're going to be presenting with two third grade students, Juliet McEnroe and Bennett Zivick. Hi, I'm Carol Andel Judas. I'm the instructional technology in the elementary school. We put a Google shortener up so that if anybody wants to look at this at any point, there's lots of stuff that we put in there for you to go back and look at if you're interested in our project. With a Google shortener, it has to be typed in exactly as written. So if something's capital, it needs to be capital. If it's lowercase, it needs to be lowercase. So as a part of our innovation project with uh, Mara and Diane Cunningham, Claire and I decided to join forces and take Claire's class and our computer science curriculum and create a project that would focus around empathy for our first grade students. So our students are creating math games for first graders, but looking through a design lens. Students will apply the concepts of loops and conditionals that they're learning in class, and they're documenting their learning experience through a math journal that is a link to the math journal that is in our presentation. So some examples that we have focus on research, feedback, and a lot of design. So the kids get a chance to really plan themselves through the process. So with Diane Cunningham and the um, school-wide innovation group, we looked through the design thinking process and figured out language that we felt would be very beneficial to our students whenever they were doing design process in any class, science, ELA, math, or in this case, computer science. And so these were the five words that we came up with with many other students. Um, so the process goes from asking questions to imagining the possibilities to then putting that into plan, and then creating. Um, and then improving. And this is a cycle, so it always goes back to then asking how their end product could be improved. Um, so what we did is we looked at a, how we would like our end product to um, come out, which was a, a project for the first graders where they were going to pl um, plan a game that would benefit the first graders. We wanted to give them a lot of freedom and a lot of choice in what that um, looked like while also giving them the scaffold that they needed in setting up a solid um, uh, syllabus for them. So we set up a syllabus where they spent about two days on each step of the design process in order to make sure that they were able to really think deeply about each process and make sure that they were always able to go back and change and address any concerns or issues that they had through peer feedback and um, analysis. So Juliet and Bennett are going to join us now to share what they've been working on so far in the ask, imagine, and plan stages. So Bennett, how did you do your research? Um, so we looked at games that were already made on Scratch, math games, and we saw what we liked about <coughs> them and what we didn't like. To, for our games, and then we, um, yeah. Awesome job. <laughs> so then, Juliet, oops, sorry, sweetie. What did you do when you went to observe first graders? Um, we look, ask them what they, what they're, what they were interested in and like what they were learning and what they liked to do and we were gonna put them together and try to make it like a fun and learning game during yeah when we went during math math period <laughs> what was your next step after observing the first graders we started planning so we, we came up with three ideas and then we um, the people, uh, we went into groups and they gave us feedback. And how did that feedback help? 
they taught they told us um, what we could work on and what game they think was the best. Out of your three ideas. Yeah. Great. Ooh, sorry. So, what idea are you designing now? Um, this was my um, partner's idea that I really we both really liked, and so the first graders they liked like parties and animals. So there's a like a big party going on and dancing animals, and there's gonna be a question that says like which matches like fifteen minus five, and there's gonna be some balloons. One of them has the correct answer and the other ones are incorrect and if you get it right you get a point and there's a box in the corner of all your points and if you get it incorrect it just goes to the next um, question. Great. That's better. Can you share your idea? My idea is there's a, a volcano and a person and the volcano is exploding a bunch of sa shapes mm -hmm. and it's going to say a shape and you have to tap that shape before a bird comes and eats you. <laughs> <laughs> Jurassic Park. These are just some more examples of the students working. Um, right now, we are just our next cycle session. We are going to really start getting into Scratch and building the game and start coding. So they've gotten up to the planning process. Now they're going to start creating. I have another question for Juliet. Okay. So, Juliet, what are your hopes for the first grade? Um, that they're going to learn something from our game and, like, have fun with it. And what has been difficult so far about the process? Well, so far it hasn't really been difficult, the planning, but eventually I think it might be a little difficult with all the code. Stuff. And what are you going to do if it gets difficult or hard or doesn't work? Like, try again and, <laughs> like, try to fix the book. And Bennett, has there been anything that's been easy about the project? Uh, the whole thing so far was pretty easy because we got to know what the first graders like and we had clear instructions. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> um, So, the next part of this is how we're going to actually assess the students throughout this whole project. So. Um, the students in my class are very familiar with checklists and rubrics because we use them often for um, teachers' college reading and writing project. And it's a really great way for them to be able to see what have they already done and what is their next step. And to also make it transferable, not just to this project, but when they go into another design thinking process about what are they doing well and what is something that they need to work on making sure that they achieve the next time that they go into a process. So just putting it, we just made a very clear checklist to, that goes through pretty much each of the steps that we're doing um, every day so that they can make sure that they do not miss anything and that they're able to um, really achieve each of the steps of the process. And we designed a rubric with Diane Cunningham that touches on computer science concepts through the actual project design through the design process itself and what the students will be doing each step so it really captures the whole project without losing their authenticity to it. And also as a class, um, throughout the year we've um, created our own collaboration rubric. So we started by looking at what it would look like in third grade and we discussed all the different aspects of what it would look like to collaborate successfully and we defined those as the class and then throughout over a few months we filled in what that would look like as a second grader, first grader and eventually as a fourth grader and they're also in the process of making it interactive so as you can see there's a few links that are um, put into the rubric and they have created videos that model the behavior that they're talking about so for level three um, for the listening aspect it would be looking and listening to partners with empathy and they created a little video that showed what that would look like um, and then we're inserting them into the rubric so that future years will not only have the rubric but will also be able to see the way that that rubric looks in process. Um, and also the Google shortener at the bottom is a link to the rubric so then you can also see the videos if you're interested. And lastly 
while our students are working on these projects, Mayapac Schools has just started working in Scratch. So as they begin their game design unit, um, we hopefully after April break are going to do a Google Hangout with Claire's class during their computer science time and a third grade class at Mayapac. And they are going to interview our kids as design experts. And our kids are going to advise them on what it takes to make a really great game. Any questions? Do you guys have any questions mm -hmm. for us? Just a quick question. How many times a cycle do they have computer science? So with the schedule, I see them every other cycle. OK. Um, but what we did was we looked at my schedule and found a common time just for innovation. So from January to June on a 6B day mm -hmm. at 210, which would be the same time I see them on an A cycle, they're coming just for innovation work. So I'm really seeing their class once a cycle. It's very impressive. Thank you. And is this, this sets the true for all third grade <coughs> classes, or is this just this? It's a pilot program. This so is a pilot. We would love to do this with the whole third grade eventually, but I think this so far has really grown into something more than what we even imagined in the beginning. Do they have names for the games yet? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I'm sure they'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the end goal would be for our kids to, when they're finished and they give each other feedback, then they're going to play them with the first graders and do some sort of a <laughs> celebration because they've been working tremendously hard. It's amazing to see how it began from January to now. So how did you select third grade? Um, Claire and I are on the innovation yeah. mm -hmm. committee, okay. and we just partnered up. Okay. Impressive. That's pretty cool. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So um, so next up, I think, is the, the budget presentation. Yeah. So Dan. The administration had a very fun St. Patrick's Day morning uh, going over the budget, and I'm going to give you a few highlights here, and hopefully by the end the board can ad uh, will adopt the budget uh, that can go forward uh, for the uh, community to vote on in May. Next slide, Connie, please. We are towards the end of the, our budget process. We're uh, recommending and adopting the budget. Uh, so the only step after this is the public hearing in early May and then the referendum uh, on, uh, I think, the second or third Tuesday in May, whenever that is. Um, so we're towards the end. Next slide, please, Connie. Uh, we begin with our enrollment. Uh, let's see. Can you X out of that bottom part? Right the, the X on that bottom. Covered a little bit. We're down about 30 kids, um, but it's spread out throughout uh, the district. However, we are going down one section in the elementary school, and we're proposing to replace that with a uh, literacy coach and some additional art that was actually reduced in the current year's budget that we feel uh, we need back. Other than that, staffing is uh, completely flat. And for enrollment, uh, was 2014, was that an all-time high for the district? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And so if you went back, I don't know, three or four years before that, was it more like the 1,600 and change, or do you, do you know? I don't remember offhand, but I think it was, I think it got below 1,600. It was 1,500 and something yeah. two or three years before. It was. Yeah, it, it, it went up real quick. I mean, if, when we went back uh, three, four years ago, we uh, actually thought we'd be up around 1,800 to, because of the trend. We were actually talking about relocating central office outside of the building because we thought we might need that classroom space. Uh, so we're, we're actually very fortunate that we've leveled off and uh, are starting to see a little dip at this point. I think this community is really hard to project. So we're looking at flat staffing overall. And uh, hopefully enrollment is plateaued. Um, next slide, Connie, please. 
Yeah, and our tax levy cap um, calculates actually to this this year for an adjusted cap of about 2.64%, and that's based on mostly an allowy, allowable levy growth factor of 2%, which is inflation, 2% for the, uh, the inflation for that period that's measured uh, was actually over 2%, but we're capped at 2%. And then we have a tax-based growth factor, which uh, reflects uh, additions to the assessment role. Um, so that calculates to about 2.64%. Um, and we felt uh, from the beginning that we'd have no problem staying within that cap. Uh, next slide, please, Connie. Uh, as you can see, our budget history and tax levy change, um, annual uh, changes have, have kind of, uh, for the last 10 years, been fairly flat versus the 10 prior years, fairly, uh, fairly high. And if you go to the next slide, Connie, um, I think the, the compounded annual growth rates uh, from 1999 through 2009 uh, was about 7% versus, I think, 1.6% or so from 2009 through uh, this current budget. So I think over the last decade, uh, this current board and, and prior boards have, have done uh, a great job at bending the cost curve. Uh, there was, uh, you know, there were a lot of factors that led to uh, uh, steep increases in those years, uh, primarily enrollment. But, uh, you know, the, I think the, the last uh, decade boards have, uh, have actively sought and, and achieved bending that cost curve. Uh, next slide, please, Connie. Um, this budget has about 75.4% in it for salaries and benefits. That's the kind of purplish color. Um, those are salary and benefit uh, object codes within the budget. And the uh, other 24.6% or so uh, are contracted services, textbooks, supplies, equipment, and also debt service for the most part. Uh, next slide, please, Connie. Uh, keep going until the whole page fills. There you go. So we're proposing uh, for 2018-19, $48.2 uh, million, roughly. Um, and we, we collect revenue other than property tax of about $5.4 million. So we're looking at a, a tax levy or, or at least um, resources that we have to get outside of rev um non-property tax of about $42.8 million. Now, without appropriating any fund balance, last year or the current year we're in, we appropriated about half a million dollars uh, to offset the tax levy. The tax levy change would be about 3.18. However, as you'll find out later, I'm projecting uh, um, a positive variance in the current year budget of over half a million dollars, so the board feels comfortable in... Um, offsetting the 2018-19 tax levy with about $500,000. That brings the tax levy increase uh, to about 1.97%, and that's about $276,000 under the cap. And if we were to exceed the cap, we would need a 60% uh, supermajority of the uh, voting uh, population to do so, but this does not exceed the cap. As I mentioned, it's under the cap. So we just need one more person to vote for the budget than votes against it. Uh, next slide, please, Connie. Just yeah, that's it. So we're asking the board to adopt. Uh, you can go back to the last slide so we can read the number. Uh, a, a proposed 2018-19 budget of one, hit enter one more time. Read it again. Uh, there you go. $48,222,978, resulting in a tax levy of $42,347,978. Just a question on the uh, the revenue, because uh, the expense side, I think, uh, was discussed in a lot of detail uh, last week. 
on the on the revenue side, any risk in the five point three seven five? What's going on at the state or other things that are kind of in that? There's a, there's I think a few things in there. I think we're fairly conservative on state aid. Okay. Um, there's, you know, we're relying a lot on special education tuition. Um, so far, you know, the last couple of years, our our enrollments uh, for non Bronxville kids in our special ed classes, which we then go back and bill the home districts for have been robust and uh we're budgeting fairly aggressively sorry rachel but uh that would be a little bit of revenue risk but we would if, if we don't make those targets we would know that early on we would know that in the fall by november and we could adjust accordingly and then with um they they changed the tax laws on the 529 529 accounts um, I don't know if it's going to positively or negatively impact us, but you can use $10,000 now in those accounts to send. I'm not sure if you can send it. I know for private school, but I'm not sure if you can use it for public school. I've asked a question. I haven't got a clear answer. But do you have any sense if that's going to help us or hurt us? No. <laughs> uh, what I can tell you is that we have uh, eight new requests. These are new kids going out of district for private school transportation uh, so far and that deadline is April 1st That's so it next, looks like we have yeah year. so we have we have uh, a few more kids looking going to private school within 15 miles of Bronxville and that's always been a kind of a direct relationship with the economy mm -hmm. in 2008 2009 we saw those those numbers plummet uh, now, the, you know, the stock market and the economy has been fairly robust for a number of years, so uh, we're seeing private school transportation requests increase, so we're keeping a close eye on that. How many are rolling off, either graduating seniors or you haven't? I haven't, I haven't gone in that far yet. Uh, I wait till April 1st to do an analysis to project where we're going to be next year. But uh, I think the budget number we have in is adequate because it – we also have to take into account what's going on in other schools as well because we group these kids on buses together to try and get the you know the most efficient routes possible in the consortium that we participate in with Bronxville, Eastchester, Pelham, and Tucko. Any other questions for Dan on the topic? Great. Can I get a motion to um, the resolution is, I guess, up on the screen. Um, a motion to approve the resolution to um, accept the budget. So moved. Move. Second. Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Any any whoops? Any discussion? Okay, Dr. Montesano. Yeah, I don't have much uh, more to add. I just want to say happy spring, everybody. Fortunately, we um, are right at our limit of days used compared to how many we have planned. So we're, we're still in good shape um, as of now. I can't guarantee there won't be another nor'easter coming our way sometime in April, perhaps. Uh, but assuming that that doesn't happen, we're still OK. Uh, but it's been a, you know, a fairly challenging winter for all of us. And I appreciate everybody's uh, support, despite the phone calls about why we're having off school, why we don't have off from school, <laughs> et cetera. But um, that's, uh, it's been OK, but it's been a challenge. Um, and I just want to echo John's comments earlier about the referendum, and I, I also want to thank the uh, community for their participation, for their input, and ultimately for their support of the referendum. Uh, it's certainly an exciting time for us here. Um, I also want to extend that appreciation to the board for the support throughout uh, the planning of this referendum, because I know you've been at it even longer than I've been at it, um, and it's uh, it's. It's really nice to know that uh, we have uh, the community support on this, and I'm very excited about the uh, about the projects that we have in our referendum, and I can't wait to get those things going on the right track. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. And um, that's it for me, John. Great. Uh, Dr. Kelly? Yes, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Relatively short agenda this evening. I do want to take just a moment and um, celebrate Peter Royal, who has indicated his desire to um, resign for the purpose of retirement. He's been with us for 15 years and um, has really been um, 
brilliant in all aspects of theater. Um, he's touched um, basically all of the middle school students through a drama exploratory, um, and then uh, electives in the high school, and he's really created a safe haven and a place where all students feel welcomed and valued. So uh, we will have plenty more opportunities to celebrate him, but I didn't uh, want the moment to pass without saying a few words. And I don't know if those of you who are at the play on Friday night, I happened to be there when they did a tribute to Peter on stage, and he was uh, quite surprised and touched, and uh, they had alumni come on up to the stage and sing, and it was really quite a moment for Peter and a great way for him to uh, end his career here. Nice. In addition, we have um, a few resignations. We have requests for FMLA leave, a few overages to help cover the leaves, as well as a shift in teacher mentors. Um, we have a, a teacher aid appointments as it relates to um, um, new teacher aides uh, that are in the budget. They're replacing um, some resignations as well as substitute teachers and substitute teacher aides. And then we had one minor revision to the spring coaches roster, which was an, um, an addition of a modified baseball coach. So before you, you have proposals A through N. You wanna do that in one, in one go? Yeah. Okay, uh, any questions for Dr. Kelly on the personnel? A motion to approve. Um, Items A through N? Moved. Second. Any discussion? Great. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Any Thank nays? You. Great. Uh, Dan, I think you're back up. In the budget presentation, I recommended or I uh, referred to um, the current year um, variances in the, uh, in the budget. Uh, we are seeing roughly $560,000 of a positive variance, uh, mostly directed to uh, salary savings and replacements and turnover, uh, coupled with also positive variances in uh, special ed and regular ed tuition accounts. So that $560,000, the board has, uh, has just decided to use half a million of it to offset the 2018-19 tax levy. So uh, we're still gonna be in, in, in pretty good financial shape uh, going into next year. Thanks, Dan. Great. And uh, I do have two financial action items. Uh, the first is a donation it's actually a matching donation that we received from the Benevity <coughs> Community Impact Fund, which represents an anonymous matching gift from a Morgan Stanley employee and will be uh, used for the middle school principal's discretionary account. And then uh, we also have uh, a renewal for our insurance and risk management uh, services. Um, the fee for this service has been cut uh, substantially from the prior year uh, and these uh, consultants were uh, instrumental in helping us through two uh, horrific flood claims and in uh, in actually just the fact that we can get flood insurance <laughs> is owed uh, directly to these consultants uh, so I would recommend that we uh, re-up for another year and uh, task them with trying to get reduced flood insurance for us now that we have the the Oops. mitigation uh, system up and running. How, how did we get them to cut their rate? Uh, I think Mr. Troopin, there used to be two of them. Mm -hmm. Mr. Troopin is retired. So we're dealing uh, exclusively with Mr. Skolsky now. So we'll see how that works. And you use these, uh, this firm in the past for how many years? At least 10, the 10 that I've been here. <coughs> and. Um, uh, I, I, they, you know, I've had questions in the past, you know, why don't we just go directly to brokers? You know, no. the, these guys don't sell anything. They just, we, we pay them to advise us and they're, they're a disinterested financial party. And, uh, 
you know, the, the, uh, their recommendations in the past have, have, have steered us very, very well. And what's our total insurance expense that these... This That's 600000 So 12000 is yeah. a small it's, investment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions for Dan? Motion to um, approve items A and B on the financial action items. Move. Second. Second. I'll do it. Any discussion? Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Okay. Thanks. Um, Dan, I think you're still up. Um, the facilities. Yeah, we got some snow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a lot of it melted today. You know, we, if anybody was by the school, you know, in, in some of the valleys on the roof, we had to, uh, it was melting quick and coming down hard. So we had to, uh, uh, you know, put up a lot of tape and, and, and uh, keep people away from those areas where it was coming off the roof. But that's a good sign also for our fields. Uh, we, we're hoping to have them back early next week. We've looked into plowing them. Uh, which is cost prohibitive and 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 at times might even violate the uh, the warranty on 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 the field. So we we don't feel we need to do that, um, but uh, we're actively trying to get those uh, usable as soon as possible. And uh, I have one facilities action item related to uh, the referendum vote. Uh, this comes from our bond council, which is authorizing us uh, to issue bonds as per uh, the referendum results. So we intend to issue a maximum of $21.8 million in bonds and uh, I think a seven or eight page uh, <laughs> resolution from our bond council authorizes us to do so. So I think, um, is this a roll call vote? Or yes. So we just go around and okay. So any discussion about the um, the bond resolution? I think this was circulated in advance, so people have had a chance to read it. I, I'm just Dan. I'm assuming you do this each time. Yes. Okay. Yes, this is uh, this is strictly compliance with uh, New York State local finance law. Thank you. When's the first possible day you can actually see issuing bonds? I mean, it's a couple years out, isn't it? Yeah. I would say probably 2020, 2021. But the bands would come earlier. Yeah. yeah. Do this is authorized the bands as well? Uh, yeah, the bands the bands are authorized uh, with this as well. Okay. Once, we're, once we can issue bonds, we can issue bands. Okay. So. Uh, motion to... Um, Move. Second. <laughs> Great. So I'll just go around. Mike? Approve. 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 Approved. Approved. Okay. Um, motion carries. That's it for facilities, Dan? That's it. Okay. Any committee reports? Great. Um, I think at this point we go to uh, public, uh, public commentary. Dr. Katz. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. David Katz. I'm a uh, social studies teacher in our Bronxville Middle School and also president of the Bronxville Teachers Association, the union that represents 226 of Bronxville's teachers, teacher assistants, secretaries, nurses, clerks, teacher aides, and other classroom and out-of-classroom support positions. And it's in that capacity as a representative of the vast majority of the employees of our school district that I address the board this evening. First, to congratulate Peter Royal on behalf of the BTA uh, for his 15 years of service in Bronxville, his entire uh, career in education, and we hope, uh, as always, that his retirement is the longest and happiest part of his life. Um, we look forward to honoring Peter at our end of the year dinner in June uh, and inviting his family to celebrate with us. A well, family of uh, teachers, by the way. They, uh, uh, <laughs> his son is my son's favorite teacher. Um, just a, an aside. Just over a month ago, all of us who care about schools and care about students, which is to say, all of us, mourned together the tragic loss of 17 members of the school community in Parkland, Florida. Every educator and every parent, 
Every citizen was horrified by the scene of death and terror in an environment which was supposed to be safe, nurturing, and educational. Teachers have told me that many of our students here in Bronxville, from kindergartners even up to seniors, have expressed their fears and anxiety in the wake of that event. I said that we were horrified, but not that we were shocked. Sadly, events like the massacre in Parkland and the more recent school shooting at Great Mills High School in Maryland have become commonplace. Since Columbine, now 19 years ago, schools around the country have changed the ways in which we operate. All of our students currently are, have lived in a post-Columbine world. Teachers and students in the United States are in fact terrified and our federal and state governments have not done enough to address the issues of gun access or of school safety. Here in Bronxville, the Bronxville Teachers Association has been advocating for additional measures to ensure the safety and security of Bronxville students and staff. And we've come a long way as a community to address these concerns. We now have security at each of our main doors, do a better job of ensuring that side doors are locked, have badges for all of our staff and require identification of visitors. And more recently, uh, the uh, district has enacted measures to tighten these security protocols in ways that require additional cooperation from our staff and from our parent community and from visitors as they come in. And the BTA applauds that at those, at the enactment of those changes and thanks people in, uh, in advance already for the work that they are doing to ensure that the Bronxville School remain, remains as safe as possible. And regardless of how we might feel about issues related to gun control, we can't help but to applaud our students in their civic engagement. On March 14th, the one month anniversary of the Parkland shooting, hundreds of our elementary, middle, and high school students exited their classrooms for 17 minutes in a show of solidarity with the students of Parkland. The eighth graders who were with me on a bus down to Washington, D.C. for their trip uh, all wore red, the color of the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, and held many of them wore a, uh, held a 17 minute moment of silence while they were on the bus. These student-led protests and the ones around the country are exactly what the Bronxville promise speaks to. Students exhibited leadership, passion, and persistence. They showed courage in asking for change and they collaborated to engage in the world around them to make an attempt at making it a better place. We're also incredibly proud of our students from Christina Rydell's high school social studies classes who participated in a discussion about school safety and gun violence with the Bronxville Chief of Police the local assemblywoman Amy Paulin, County Executive George Latimer, and U.S. Representative Elliot Engel, connections that Ms. Rydell has made through her work as a political advocate uh, with the BTA. Those who listened to our students were incredibly impressed with, the, with our students' thoughtfulness and maturity. Since then, many of our soon-to-be voters registered, and those who are already 18 voted this week in a, lo a local village election in Bronxville. I'm proud to be an educator in Bronxville where young adults are awakening to the changes they can make being engaged in their community. This coming Saturday, Bronxville Teachers Association is join, joining millions of people around the country to support our students in the March for Our Lives. We're standing up and marching to demand that students' lives and safety become a priority and that we end gun violence and mass shootings in our schools. We'll be asking our representatives to address issues of access to weapons and school safety. We'd love to see lots of members of the Bronxville community marching with us. We'll be marching in New York City with our BTA banner. We're meeting at a Starbucks on the west side of the street at Broadway between 70th and 71st. Please join us. I'll be there with my family and hope to see you there with yours. There's also a march in Westchester County if you're looking for something more uh, convenient in White Plains and some of our teachers will be marching there. Despite our collective vigilance, there is more preventative, <coughs> proactive and palliative work to be done inside of our walls regarding the mental health of our students. This generation is growing up in one of the most stressful eras in, hum in American history, particularly for children, teenagers and young adults. As I said earlier, every student we have lives in a post-Columbine world their whole lives. Teachers, guidance counselors, school psychologists, school administrators are identifying issues and doing our best to address them. Our team of school psychologists, guidance counselors, deliver expertise working with teachers, students, and their families. 
The BTA would like to ask the board to begin considering increasing support for troubled students at every stage of development. We believe it would be in our students' best interest if we were to add to our faculty another mental health professional, a school psychologist or school social worker. The new realities of stress culture means that more parents and more students need support than ever before. It's been almost a decade since this district employed a K-12 school social worker and believe that would be a position that could enhance our ability to assist students and families in relationship issues that cause this kind of stress. School psychologists have mental health training that would be incredibly useful in addressing the needs of children and teenagers. We'd like to do everything we can to support our students both at home and at school and believe that as an additional support position could help us. The bottom line is that we want to do what is best for our kids. School should be a place of safety and comfort in a turbulent world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Anybody else from the public? Great. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for permitting me to speak. Uh, my name is Sean Abbott. I am a. Um, I'm here for two reasons. Um, I'm here as the parent of two kids who just love the Bronxville School so much that this is my first, to my shame, this is my first time at a Board of Education meeting because there's been no reason to come because my kids just love the school so much. So you don't pay attention to those things that don't need any attention paid to them. Um, but I'm here as a journalist because uh, I have a question, which is very simply, has the board heard about the uh, process that the village has been using, um, and it's in many respects an intelligent choice because we live in a place where there are old pipes in the ground and it's time for them to come out and be replaced. Or there's this newfangled method called cured in place in which you melt plastic inside the old pipe and um, that keeps the uh, that keeps the wastewater and the groundwater uh, separate. This is very important. Um, we live in a time, of course, where a lot has been put in the ground that uh, people have private ownership of, corporations own different cables and things. So it's hard to get at pipes sometimes. Um, the reason that um, I'm concerned about this, obviously, as a parent is because the the newfangled method, the less expensive method, the cured in place piping, is known to contain during the, during the procedure of installation, it's known to release into the local environment cancer causing volatile compounds and endocrine disruptors, endocrine disrupting compounds, which for young people to come into contact with that or for somebody who is with child, this is a very bad situation. Um, I have been asking across the street at Village Hall, well, what's up? You, you guys made this decision to, to go with the cured in place piping over the more conventional uh, method of just digging the pipes out and replacing them and I understand why under certain circumstances that's necessary. but. Where has it happened and why? Um, so my question to this board is, uh, is this the first time you're hearing about cured in place piping? Are you concerned about it? And um, just as a parent, the more I look into it, the more I am very concerned that, that the village administrator cannot answer this question. When I put this question to him, in a straightforward fashion, it's simply this. Is it over? I mean, has cured, is, is it stopped? No, it hasn't. We don't know when we will be using this method next. I'm not going to tell you. The reason that I'm addressing this to the board is because I first found out about cured in place piping on Halloween night, right outside the Bronxville School. Halloween had, uh, unfortunately chose to fall on a Tuesday night last year and 
the guys weren't paying attention and they were out in front of the school with four tractor trailer trucks uh, doing their cured in place piping installation releasing massive amounts of steam into the air now what they are trained to say is that's just steam it's non-toxic we know this to be untrue we know this to be untrue because Purdue University, where we send some of our students, um, with a grant from the National Science Foundation Rapid Response Study, uh, has come to the conclusion, and it's, it's being very explicit in warning municipalities, if you've gotten involved with cured in place piping, stop doing it until we find out more about exactly how it interacts with the human body. Um, Beyond that concern, there's, you know, we have this idea in, in medicine, we're very concerned when we're, taking, when we're taking medications, this idea of contraindication. You don't want to take something that's contraindicated. Um, if somebody tells you that a process is safe in and of itself, the question always is, <laughs> it's safe in and of itself, but is it contraindicated by some other engineering technique which is also involving some kind of uh, uh, dangerous compounds. So my question for the school, as a parent, I've got a kid enrolled in the school now, she's 16, um, but also as a journalist is, what's the future of cured in place piping at the school? We know that there's cured in place piping under, quote, under the school. That's as much as I've been told by the village administrator. My question is where under the school um, according to the industry, the cured in place, uh, the, the volatile aspect of it is over after two hours. This is simply untrue. Purdue University tells us six months before we have measured the final dispersal of these gases inside an environment. So according to village administrator Jim Palmer, under the school, there are, are um, cured in place pipes. Um, according to Andrew Welton at Purdue University, as soon as that happened, there was supposed to be an independent study of the air quality in those affected areas of the school. So did that happen? What are the results? Um, is there going to be mo more of this cured in place piping placed in the school um, either when the students aren't here or when the students are here because the trucks were out on Halloween night and I wasn't the only person responding to the fact that the whole street smelled of um, that wonderful odor of uh, airplane glue. Um, we have seen communities as uh, close as Nyack have whole uh, neighborhoods shut down because the cured in place fumes were so noxious. Um, it's been reported uh, um, in California recently that a school was shut down and parents weren't able to get into it because of activity that was happening down the street with cured in place piping. So uh, my question is simply, uh, is the board aware of this and what's going to happen in future? And um, uh, and when, um, when it's time for this process to be done again, will some notification be given to parents acknowledging what the Purdue University study tells us? Um, across the street, the, the village trustees are pleading ignorance, but now we know. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you for your comments. Anybody else? Great. Motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Second. Staying away. We're done. <laughs>